Uh, a month ago, God started just stirring something in my spirit. And uh, I shared this with our creative crew. And, and he just started this, this, these words, just something new, something fresh. Something new, something fresh. And I've learned over time that when God speaks, he waits for us to respond. So when God speaks, he waits for a response. So, all right, so he, he drops us in my spirit. Something new, something fresh. So over the last month, I've been processing, God, what are you trying to say? What does this mean? What am I taking out of this? So I've learned that in order for God to do something new and something fresh, first we need to make room. Because he could be ready to do something, but we're not ready. There might be things in the way that need to get out of the way. And, and this is something important. God will only fill the space that I allow him to. So he'll only fill the space that you're willing to allow him to fill in your life. And tonight, I want to challenge you in making room so that you can raise your banner. Because there's a praise inside of all of us. There's a victory shout inside of all of us. But sometimes the junk of life, the things of life, hold us back. They hold us back, but not tonight. Amen. We, we're going to shout. We're going to praise we're going to lift him up in this house. Come on. Give two people a high five and you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. God is wanting to do something new and something fresh. I'm going to go right to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Chapter 9, verses 18 and on. And I'm going to paraphrase a lot of it. And this is a story of a ruler that... He runs to Jesus. He finds Jesus and he tells him, hey, Jesus, my, my daughter's dead. But if you come to my house and you lay your hands on her, she'll, she'll live. So then Jesus, he, he goes, all right. So he follows. He follows. He goes. And then he walks into his house. And as he walks into this guy's house, he, he hears the sound of flutes playing. And, and the Bible, in different versions, it says funeral music and people crying and wailing because this girl is dead. But I love what Jesus says next. He says, make room. The girl is not dead. She is sleeping. And other versions say, clear out. And my favorite, my favorite, it says, get out. The girl is not dead. She's sleeping. And then after he says that, verse, verse uh, 20, uh, 24, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And then the response of the people, they ridiculed him. They laughed at him. They told him, well, who does this joker think he is? This girl's dead. She's been dead for, so, for, for a while already. But verse 25, but when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl, the girl arose. But when the crowd was put outside, when they were put outside, I said when they were put outside, they didn't volunteer and said, oh, you got company, I'm going to step outside. No, they got put outside. Somebody had to say, hey, excuse me, you got to get out of the way. You got to get out of the room because there's somebody a lot more important than you that just showed up. All right, you're not getting it. And I believe that the lesson in this scripture, it's, it's not so much the fact that this little girl received a miracle because the miracle wasn't that she was resurrected because Jesus never said she was dead, did he? He said she was sleeping. So the second that he said, hey, get out of the way, make room, clear out. What are you thinking? She's not dead. She's sleeping. The second he spoke it, she was sleeping. Even though to them it seemed like she was dead, she wasn't dead. She wasn't dead. Sometimes a lot of us, we, we're praying for answers. We're praying for a breakthrough. We're praying for a miracle, for a solution. We're praying for God to come through. And let me tell you something tonight. It's already on its way. Help is already on the way. Breakthrough is coming. Jesus has showed up and he's standing right outside your door. You got to stop listening to all the noise and all the funeral music that's around you. All the people crying and complaining, oh, well, you know, maybe next time. Maybe, oh, yeah, your marriage, oh, it's falling apart. Oh, it's okay. Maybe you'll find somebody else. Oh, your kids are rebellious. Oh, you know, oh, man, it's okay. Just have another one, <laughs> you know. Stop listening to all the noise. Stop listening to all the noise because all of those things can easily drown out the truth. 
And John chapter 8 verse 32 says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Who will set you free? I said, who will set you free? The truth will set you free. John 14 verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is Jesus talking. So Jesus will set you free. And sometimes junk just gets in your way. Just, you, you get just so distracted by so many things in life that you start listening to the wrong things and you stop hearing the truth of God. I loved Marilyn Hickey this morning. She said everything was, you got to get into the word. You got to get into the word. The, the word will change your life. God's word will transform you. I loved it. Because that's the truth. The truth will set you free. You need a breakthrough. The truth will set you free. You need your life to be changed. The truth will set you free. Because I can talk and talk and talk. And we can sing and sing and sing. But until the truth becomes a reality in your life, your life will not change. Jesus will change your life. Come on and give him praise in this place. Yeah. There's some things in our life. There's some things in our life that we just need to kick out. I want you to think about it right now, right where you are. There's some things that have come into your space, into your room, and you just need to kick them out. There's some people. There's some attitudes. There's some, way, some ways of thinking, some patterns and behaviors that are taking up space. And they're, they're, they're keeping you from receiving your breakthrough, your miracle. Just like with this little girl. She was asleep. But everybody in the room thought she was dead. But not until they got put out. Then everyone got to see, oh, oh, the truth. Oh, Jesus was not, he, was, he said the truth. The truth said the truth. This guy's the real deal. And a lot of people, they, they see you go to church. They see us go to church. They hear us talking about Jesus. But they don't see the truth because we're still caught up with being distracted. And we need to let the, the truth of God become something that's a part of our lives. Where, where we don't have to preach to people so they can believe in our Jesus, in our God. They just see it in us. They, they see, oh, hey, you used to do these things, but you don't do them anymore. You used to talk this way, but you don't talk that way no more. What's different? Oh, I kick some things out. What? I kicked some things out. I got rid of some things. Well, like what? Like you got rid of some furniture? Something like that. And I want you to think about it. What are things in your life that are just holding you back and not letting you move forward? Over time, we get familiar with pain. Over time, we get familiar with anxiety. We get familiar with stress. We get familiar with these emotions and these feelings that we get to a place where if we don't feel these things, if they're not around us, we don't know what to do. And sometimes God just says, I want to set you free. But you're like, oh, yeah, no, but I want to hold on to it a little longer. It's, it's comfortable. It's comfortable. But tonight, if I can ask you, hey, talk, talk, talk to those things. Talk to those problems. Talk to those circumstances. <laughs> I, I just when I was writing my notes, I'm like, if I can just imagine, like, all right, here's, here's doubt and unbelief and fear. And I would say, hey, I appreciate your company, but my breakthrough is more important than your company. And my breakthrough, guess what? My breakthrough standing at the door. So, hey, hasta luego. I'll see you later. You got to get out of the way. Because my breakthrough has just showed up. Somebody tell your neighbor, my breakthrough has showed up. Amen. Amen. Earlier this week, God spoke to me and he said to, to tell you guys tonight, raise your banner. Raise your banner. And I'm like, all right, God, what's, what's up with the banner? I've been watching the NBA playoffs, so basketball, and it's the, the championship, the Golden State Warriors and Toronto Raptors and the Los Angeles Lakers. No, no, they didn't make it. And, 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 and the thing is, now they're playing for a trophy. They're playing to be called champions. And teams get trophies, players get rings, and the organization gets a banner. So the organization has the privilege, whoever wins the championship, of raising a banner in their arena. So then when people show up, they're like, oh, this is the home of the world champions. So a banner identifies you with who you are. And you can be wearing a jersey, an inspired jersey, and we have a banner up there. And people see your shirt and they identify you with, oh, they belong to the world champions. You don't have to be in the room, 
But when people know that there's a banner raised, they identify you with the banner. In medieval times, the, the Middle Ages, when the, the armies would go to war, you, t- you see all these like Braveheart and all these movies, right? Like they come out with all these banners, all these standards, flags everywhere. And a lot of that was because it, they know who they're fighting. They know they belong to this kingdom. They know who they belong to. They, they're fighting for this king. They didn't have to be reminded. Their armor was branded. But it was to let their enemies know, hey, you sure you want some of this? You sure you want some? This, this is my king. This is who I, this is who I fight for. We've defeated, we've defeated them. We've defeated them. You sure you want some of this? You sure you want some of this? And then so... So, all right, that's all the practical stuff. Then I went to the Bible. I'm like, all right, God, well, okay, raise a banner. What about raise a banner? It's like, what? And then he goes, all right, I go to Exodus chapter 17, and there's a story of Moses. First, first account of a banner in the Bible. And then you have chapter 17 verse, um, and it, I'll just paraphrase the story. This is the first war that the Israelites have, and they're, they're facing the Amalekites. And God tells Moses, hey, go to the top of the hill and take your staff. And as long as you have your arms raised up high, the Israelites, you, you, our people will be winning. And so then he goes to the top of the mountain, to the hill, and he goes with Aaron and her. And he's up there and he's holding as, as, as best as he can because they used to fight from, they used to fight like for reals, like from sunrise to sunset. So imagine just Moses up there trying to hold it, hold, you know. And, and then his arms will start going down. And every time his arms would come down, the Amalekites would start just kicking butt and, and the Israelites would be, you know, start losing people. So then Aaron and her noticed that, hey, we need to do something because that's our leader. We got to back him up. We got to lift his up. We got to do something. So then they, they, they find a stone. The Bible says they find a stone. They sit, they sit Moses on this stone and then, then one, one person grabs this arm. The other one grabs this arm. And then they just hold him up. And then this is what I love, verse, verse 14. So chapter 17, verse 14. After the victory, after the victory, somebody say victory. So obviously they, they got the victory, right? All right, don't get, don't get too serious. Chill out, relax, come on. The Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a, as, on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it out loud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar there and named it Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. And just a quick, quick, some points real quick. Number one, after the victory. So they got the victory. And just a side note, can, can, I, can I say something? I, I know I have it here. The Israelites were guaranteed the victory as long as Moses could maintain his posture or position. To remain in posture or, or to maintain this position, he had to be in obedience or in alignment to God's word. So you're guaranteed victory in all your circumstances if you can align your heart, align your way of living to the word of God. Just saying. All right. Two, a permanent reminder. He says, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder. A lot of us need reminding. God's done so much for us. There's people in this room that you beat cancer. There's people in this room that you were broke and God just showed up and he blessed you so much. There's people in this room that you've fought depression for so long and God came and he just filled your life with joy. There's people in this room that you felt like there was no hope, but then he just showed up. Jesus showed up and showed you that he is the hope of the world. But it's so easy to forget. So in this instant, God tells Moses, write this permanently for Joshua. See, at this point, Joshua had no idea that that he would eventually be the main one leading the Israelites into so many wars, conquering so much land. So at the very beginning of his journey, God gave Joshua a word, a permanent word. Hey, I will. And it didn't say, Joshua, as long as you do this, it said, God said, I will. I will erase the memory of them, Am- Amalek from under the heaven. I will. Let me challenge you with something. Stop trying to work so hard to feel better about yourself. Stop trying so hard 
to do so many things so that you can forget about shame and the guilt that you carry. Start tr stop trying to just, just drown out the pain and the sorrow that you carry and let God take it for you. Because he says, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. This takes me, this is off my notes. In, in looking at this, are you, have, you have Moses, Aaron, her. They're on top of a hill. God says, hey, I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. It's going to be gone. So from the beginning, God tells Joshua, hey, don't worry. When you go to war with anybody, when you see a new enemy, don't worry about them because I will take care of them. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of another man that stood on, on another hill with his arms stretched wide. And he stands there and he's, and he's on the cross. He's not standing. He's hanging. And he says, it is finished. He says, it is finished. Hey, you don't, you don't have to worry. You don't have to work hard. Just trust me. And I will take care of that guilt. I will take care of the shame. I will forgive you. I will make you white as snow. And the last thing that Moses does is he builds, he builds an altar. And he names it Yahweh Nisi, which is the Lord is my banner. He builds an altar. Uh, an altar is a place of death, a place of surrender. As we know it through scripture, it's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of sacrifice. And this, in this case, it served as a reminder for the Israelites to be reminded that, hey, like God, God, he, he's the one that brought us through. It wasn't, it wasn't me, Moses, only because I had, all I had to do was get in position, put my hands up, and God did the rest, right? But that altar served as a reminder that God was for them. And then I'm like, okay, God, an altar, an altar, there has to be so much more. And then I remember this scripture that I learned as a teenager in Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks, giving to his name. And God says, it's, it's, it's not just so much that I, I, I wanted him to build an altar. It wasn't just an altar. It wasn't just a structural, structural place. But it was a reminder that. We got to praise God. It was a reminder that, hey, it doesn't matter how hard I work. I just got to praise God. My position before the Lord is a posture of praise. It's a posture of worship. He, he just tells me, hey, get in position. Hey, Chris, get in position because I'm about to do something new, something fresh in your life. Just, hey, can you praise me in advance? Can you give God some praise in advance? Sometimes you don't see it, but you don't have to see it to thank God. Amen. Because if you saw things before, then where's your faith? God, God, he, he has a way of just pushing us. There's a, there's, there's a process. There's, there's pressure. But it's all to take us to a place of victory. Amen. Amen. And God wants you to, to be able to be in a place where you can offer up a sacrifice of praise to him. Offer up a sacrifice of praise to him. Tonight, I'm going to raise my banner. I'm going to raise my praise. I'm going to raise my worship. My circumstances don't define my praise because my praise is defined by the one that I praise. And the one that I praise is God Almighty. The one that I praise is the God of the breakthrough. The one that I praise, come on. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. And some of, some of us, We've, we've raised things in our lives, and we've identified ourselves. Like I said earlier, if you have a banner raised in a room or the army comes with a banner, you know who they belong to. And a lot of us, we, we, we define our success by our accolades. We define our success by, by what we're capable of doing on our own strength. So what we do is we raise these banners. It's like, hey, I'm good at this. I'm good. I mean, people say I'm good at this, and, and we, we raise all these things up in our lives that bring some sense of sec false security. But the, all of a sudden, somebody says, hey, you're really cool, and then behind your back, they're saying, who the heck do they think they are? 
Someone says, hey, I like your jacket. I'm like, thanks. And then later they're like, oh, he thinks this is Miami Vice or what, what like detective shows and stuff. And, and, you know, you can't depend on what you're able to do on your own. I'm 36 going on 37, and, and it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and we've been talking more and more with my wife. It's like, man, where's time gone? 12 years married, and kids are, what, 10? Our son's 10, daughter's 6. And so much time has gone, you know, and, and we're still babies and stuff. At least we think we are. And it's crazy because the things that I thought, hey, that's, that's who I am. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a worship leader. I'm, I, this is what I do. And all of a sudden, we, we define ourselves by the things that we do, you know. But at some point, you're not capable of doing the things you used to do. And, and so then what happens to us? We, we start like, oh, man, I'll, I'm a failure. I used to be good at that. And I, now I'm not that good. And we start comparing ourselves and we start making room for things just to, the, the, the noise, the noise, the funeral music. And everything around us seems like there's no hope. Hey, I guess I'll just sit here and support the young people. When God says there's a call upon your life and you're like, no, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm too old. I'm 36. No, no way. <laughs> And God says, hey, no, your dream's not dead. It might be dormant. Your calling's not dead. It might be sleeping. And God's telling somebody in this room, hey, you need to, you need to kick some things out. Because in order for you to walk in your identity, you have to hear the truth. But a lot of times, we're surrounded with things that are so much louder than the voice of God. And when the world is much louder, when our fear is much louder, when our unbelief is much louder than the voice of God, it's hard. It's hard to move forward. It's hard to trust God. It's, trust. it's hard to, to seek God. Because everything around us seems distorted. And I don't know what you might be walking through. I don't know what you might be facing. I don't know what, what voices, what sounds might fill your room. But I just want to challenge you tonight because I know there's people in this room that there's just some things you need to make room. You got to clear some things out because God wants to invade your space. I speak to people and everyone's like, yeah, I want to encounter God so much more. I want to, I want to, it's not about how much you pray and how much, it's, it's how much, how willing are you for God to actually do something in your life? It starts with a decision. It's not, it's not, hey, Pastor John, do you have like a, like a 10 step plan on how I can get more spiritual? How can I hear the voice of God more? It's not following a plan. It's, it's you have to make a decision. You have to make room for God to invade your life in general. And he doesn't just want a little bit. He doesn't just want a part of you. He wants all of you. Like in this story with this little girl, it wasn't like just the little girl and, and like the relatives and the auntie and the uncles. No, there was nobody left in the room. When everybody was put outside, then Jesus walked in. He grabbed her from the hand. And she just got up. Jesus wants to walk into your circumstance. And all he has to do is show up and touch you. To touch you. You know what I love about the scripture in Matthew chapter 9? Is that this story happens with this ruler and, and this little girl and Jesus going to heal her. But in between her story, there's another story. And there's a story in between. So the ruler goes, finds Jesus. Hey, you need to come to my house. My daughter's dead. Put your, touch her and she'll come to life. He goes, okay. And Jesus starts walking. He starts walking. And all of a sudden, he feels power leave his body. And there's this woman that's had an issue of blood for 12 years that just touched the hem of his garment. 
And he tells her, hey, your faith has healed you. And then Jesus continues to the girl's house. Why is this so, why is this so significant? It's because in one instant, there's this lady that is ridiculed and has been condemned by society because of her medical condition. She doesn't belong to be amongst the people. She, she, she shouldn't be there. But she realized and she knew, if I can just touch Jesus, if I can just touch Jesus, if I can touch him, my life will be changed. So she was willing to go against the current, against the flow, against what people told her, you shouldn't do that. And, and, and then she goes, you know what, I'm going to go. And there was multitudes of people. So that here she goes, here she goes. <laughs> she says, excuse me, excuse me. Hey, get out of my way. And she had to plow her way through. She, you know, she had to press through. She had to press through until she got to Jesus. And I hope you're tracking in your mind. Just, just imagine it. She had to press through. She had to make room. She had to clear the way. She had to tell people, get out, get out. Jesus is right there. Get out. I need to get to him. And eventually she reaches him and touches him. And in the other, the, in the contrast of this, Jesus shows up to a house and he tells people, hey, you need to get out. So there's, so there's just something there. I believe God is speaking in the sense of, hey, we need to make room. What, what, what's in your life right now? And, I, and I'm done. I'm done. I'm done talking. Because you can't say it enough. You have to make a decision tonight. What areas of your life do you need to surrender to the Lord? What areas in your life can you inspect at, at this very moment and allow the Holy Spirit to just, just bring, just expose something? Because we all, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. That's my wife. I'm not perfect. And there's things in my life that daily I ask God, what do I do, what do, I do with this? Now what do I do with this? I don't know what to do with this, God. God, do something with it.